the following programs. Applied Islamic Ethics, Contemporary Islamic Studies, Counseling Psychology, Islamic Art and Architecture, Islamic Finance, and Islam and Global Affairs. Our programs empower students with the knowledge, skills, and perspectives necessary to tackle complex challenges and make meaningful contributions to their fields. Please join us for uh, the information, join us uh, our information session uh, um, this Wednesday after tomorrow uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, to learn more about our programs. Tonight marks the second installment of our thought-provoking public lecture series entitled What is Sharia? This series seeks to unravel the intricate ta tapestry of Sharia law, exploring its ethical foundations and its profound implications for human society. In our first lecture, titled What is Sharia, the, the Ethical Structure, we delved into the intricate relationship between Sharia and ethics, drawing insightful comparisons with modern legal frameworks. Today, we continue our exploration with the theme, what is Sharia, the primacy of the human, as we ex uh, uh, examine the profound value of humanity within Islamic law and critique contemporary perspectives through a nuanced and historical lens. It is with great honor that we introduce tonight's distinguished speaker, Professor Wael Halak, the Avalon Foundation Professor in the Humanities at Columbia University. Professor Halak's illustrious career spans decades of groundbreaking research in the, re in the realms of ethics, law, and political thought, offering profound insights into the complexities of Islamic traditions and the challenges of modernity. Through his scholarship, Professor Halak invites us to critically engage with the foundational principles of Islamic governance and ethics, shedding light on the enduring relevance of Sharia in today's world. For those new to the event, Professor Halak's extensive work showcases his intelligence and unwavering commitment to scholarly excellence as we embark on the intellectual journey together. Let's open our minds to new perspectives and engage in lively discussions that deepen our understanding of Islamic law and its relevance to modern society. So uh, please allow me to introduce Dr. Wal. Well, hello. Uh, so it's your, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Mu'taz. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First, um, yeah, I would, uh, I would like to thank the uh, generosity of words that uh, uh, Dr. Mu'taz has offered us today. Most of them are a lie. Uh, but uh, but that's fine. I'm happy to hear it. I want also to reiterate my thanks for uh, the uh, College for Islamic Studies and uh, the good invitation of uh, Professor Shinturk, the Dean of the College. And uh, to, again, I reiterate my extreme pleasure this time, having spent uh, now more than more than a week, almost two weeks in Qatar, that I am very very delighted to be here. So, um, so let's let's continue with the series. Uh, so last time I spoke about the um, ethical, so to speak, the domain of the ethical in the Sharia. Ah. Today I um, I am speaking. I will speak on the primacy of the human. Uh, something that uh, I don't think has been given really attention as a general category of how. 
do, for example, Western, the Western law and uh, Islamic law view simply view the human as a as a concept. So, in my first lecture, I pointed out that there are three central aspects of the Sharia that deserve special attention. Three aspects from which we can draw critical lessons about our uh, present state, about the conditions of late modernity, which we are left to face. This is not because we can retrieve the past materially, as I said last time, or even institutionally, an impossibility arising from the simple fact that these human formations are unique and their replication, exact or approximate, is impossible. <coughs> especially for, for, for philosophers or thinkers who believe in the uniqueness of particulars, this alone as a doctrine, so to speak, is significance. Once you adopt it, then it has ramifications, and one of its ramifications is the, a conclusion of this sort. Yet these formations operated by a logic that allowed them to flourish for centuries, with an internal logic that gave them not only longevity, but a constitutional sustainability that makes their longevity explicable. The argument that I will emphasize in this lecture is that this longevity is explicable in terms of the premium value that these institutions and the surrounding cultural ambiance placed on the human. Now, I noted in my first lecture that the Sharia was not just a legal system, but rather a central domain that constituted what we call Islamic culture. This cannot be overemphasized. By central domain, I mean this, that in any system, there must be, must be central and peripheral domains and that the solution of the problems of the peripheral domains always refer back to the terms and conditions of the central domain, which is what makes a peripheral domain peripheral. With the same logic, a central domain is recognized as such because it is precisely the domain that has the power or legitimacy to define other domains. If a domain becomes central, then the problems of the other domains would be considered secondary problems, whose solution follows as a matter of course only if the problems of the central domain are solved. And so my argument is that the Sharia, as a central domain that defined what Islamic culture was, was centrally concerned not with ordering society for the sake of a real politique or raison d'etat, but rather for the sake of the human as a human, as the repository of all value which other values were intended to serve, values that were seen as subsidiary to that primary value that is humanness. This claim comes with a certain acuity, especially when it issues from the comparative and contrasting epistemological position I have described in my first lecture. The comparative significance is intended to shed light on our own condition of late modernity, on where we are in the West and where we are going in the East. In other words, it is a reflection on what is happening to us in terms of our humanness within a system that is increasingly getting away from considering the human as a central value. I know some of you will flinch at the claim that modernity is increasingly distancing itself from the prime value of the human, since people generally believe that our age is the age of anthropocentrism, the age where the human, with a capital H that is, becomes the master of the world and its final arbiter. But this is a fallacy that I obviously do not accept or that I reject if it is not qualified considerably. The struggle of the human in our way to modernity 
has been to engender itself as a free, rational, willing agent, standing against the tyranny of the church as well as the absolute monarch, as I explained last time. With this came a gradual detachment from the divine and the rise of science as the domineering religion of modernity. The dawn of the capitalist, technical, and bureaucratic age in instead ended up in the enslavement of the human, enchaining him and her in a new secularized modus vivendi. Disconnecting the human from an en enchanted universe and making him and her a cosmic accident. That's important. Cosmic accident has, un uh, uh, has unfettered the will, the will, our will, and unleashed it as a transformed energy that wills power. And capitalism, technicalism, and bureaucracy were the perfect soils that allowed the seed of pure power to grow. And once the anchor was released from the cosmically enchanted, there was no stopping. The human culminates as the father of these terrains of action. The human becomes the object rather than the subject. It becomes the, inst the instrumentalized means of the capitalist, technical, and, and bureaucratic. But mind you, a deep inquiry into the telos of these three central domains, meaning central domains of modernity, among possible others, will be disappointing. At the end of the day, whatever their telos may be, that telos is not the ultimate well-being of the human. And I do not need to present to you too many examples uh, or proofs. I think every single person of fair mind nowadays knows that money and wealth have priority over human considerations. The corporation being the most manifest example of blind greed and anti-human activity, whether on the micro scale of individual humans the way they always come second to material considerations, or at the macro level, where the corporation can now be held entirely responsible for environmental destruction across the globe. The same considerations are perfectly applicable to technicalism and technology, as well as to bureaucratic domination, whether at the social or political levels. Obviously, the same goes for politics and the political, even in the so-called liberal democracies, if not especially in liberal democracies. <clears throat> Likewise, we can speak of the Foucauldian concepts of individuation and totalization. And they are, to me, much more fertile concepts than the usual interpretation given to them by many commentators. The concept of individuation implies a, a, a self severely fragmented by political, social, historical, and institutional forces. This without implying that these forces constitute separate domains. In fact, they don't. Because I am, I am speaking about legal systems and legal cultures, I wish to maintain that the modern state Especially, especially since the Napoleonic uh, Code of 1804 and the Industrial Revolution has been embarking on a trajectory that is systematically and systemically geared towards serving materialist and technical interests, such as capitalism and techniques of political power that aim at breaking social groups. That is, at atomizing the social individual. This is, of course, blatantly obvious in the cases of settling Bedouin and tribal populations in so many countries. I'm sure many of you know about this. But it is equally obvious for the sharp eye in the case of breaking up the family. The family went from extended to the nuclear, which became a standard for a while, but now it is at the verge of virtual collapse. So basically, from tribes and hamulas and clans, 
we went into the extended family and from the extended family to the nuclear family, and now we are having a tough time maintaining the nuclear family, which is basically consists of about four people and a dog, right? <clears throat> and that we cannot st keep hold of it. The family went from, 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 from such groupings into small groupings. To say that we are losing our family and communal structures is simply to state the obvious now. The severe crisis in personal relationships in the increasingly shorter and shorter duration of marriages, the disinterest in marriage and in having children, the rise of major psychological and psychotic diseases and the like, are obviously not neutral developments or normal consequences that we can accept at face value. They are the consequences and effects of a systemic way of living, but, we, but, but more importantly, of a way of thinking about the world, or rather a way of thinking the world. On the other hand, this individuation or atomization colludes with totalization at the same time. Totalization is the power of knowledge systems and of the state in imposing overarching frameworks that work to normalize and control individuals within social structures. The summation of the two operational co concepts, individuation and totalization, would be this. Break up social groups and control them en masse, a sophisticated and complex form of divide and rule. It's really the old divide and rule game, which was very well known, done on a massive and intricate and complex scale. Rather, divide, divide, break, and rule. Divide, break, and rule in mass. The overarching technology that engages these two forms is what Foucault has called biopower a modality of governance and sovereignty that, ex that explores how the state relates, uh, sorry, how the state regulates populations, lives, health, and social behavior, all in the name of well-being. Biopower, by necessity, requires intervention in biological processes and social norms, controlling the life of the population through policies, laws, regulations, and institutions. Biopower is therefore the latest wave of sovereignty, where the command over life and death acquires new forms of management, certainly more complex and certainly more subtle and sophisticated than anything existing before. If the telos of biopower is the perpetual definition and redefinition of the human, then it is also the perpetual decision over life and death over the question uh, uh, that, that should live and flourish, uh, of who should and live and flourish and how. Who should be exterminated and who shouldn't. So basically, like uh, in, 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 uh, you take the example of Gaza or uh, uh, even within a normal society, there are uh, decisions made beyond the immediate uh, context of about really the life of, including the life of traditions, traditions within society. Central to this understanding is the, is the strategies employed by the state to manage and control populations. It's important to realize here that this kind of gov governing and management goes way beyond the state's influence in terms of the three branches of power, the legislative, judicial, and executive, permeating every uh, day life, every detail of the, uh, day li daily life through institutions, discourses, and practices. Modern forms of government reflect a more subtle and insidious form of power that shapes individuals' behaviors, norms, and identities in a particular way. My point is that this way of governance has a teleology, has a purpose, has a goal that is not necessarily geared toward the human as the ultimate and highest value. Instead, the governmental rationality of the state and its social institutions emphasize through expertise and specialized knowledge of experts 
the rationalization and optimization of state power and its political economy as the final end. Now, if we take a look at how all this compares and contrasts with the Islamic scene, we see an entirely different picture. A fundamental tenet of the Sharia centers on the theoretical and practical assumption, and I here start from the general to the particular, it centers on the, on the theoretical and practical assumption that man was created to do God's work on earth as his khalifa. This is not just a theological creed, but a profoundly practice-based norm where ontology meets teleology, where reason of existence is entwined with modes of existing, modes of living and operating in the world. There cannot be a generic khalifa without exclusively taking the view that this khalifa is a particular kind of creature endowed with a rationality that can com contemplate the very reason for existence. That is serving God's ends in the world. This khalifa is microscopically produced in the form of the human. The khalifa is the closest earthly expression of divine constitution endowed with the qualities that reflect insofar, in, insofar limited human existence uh, can reflect those qualities of God. Though they cannot, of course, replicate them in their reality. That's why they say whatever we are or we know or we own is a majaz, not a haqiqa. The, haq the haqiqa of the mulk, real mulk, real own knowledge is, in the, is, is with God. And this has tremendous, tremendous social, political, and economic implications, which have proven themselves to exist in Islamic history throughout the centuries. So it's not just talk here. We are talking about a civilization that dedicated major, major parts of its resources to serve these ends. My point here is that the subjective constitution of the individual Khalifa is a material diminutive of higher qualities which is to say that the human constitution of the Khalifa is the highest teleology of the act of creation, the creation of man. Again, with the capital M, we can see this teleology at work in the list of priorities that the Sharia has established for existing as a social and political phenomenon. And we can see the same dynamic at work in the construction of the mystic ascetic individual. That, be that of a, the Zahid, the Faqir, the Abid, the Sufi, or, 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 or whatever. In other words, and as I have elaborated in the first lecture, the primary mechanism of constituting the individual assumes as its desideratum the formation of the ethical individual. And this is not a matter of virtue ethics as a luxury of moral philosophy. It is a way of living social life, living in the world at large. Socially speaking, we notice that the Sharia lays a great stress on how to maintain stability in the social order. And I would like to call it social order, not society, deliberately. I would like to reserve the term society for the social grouping constituted by and living under the modern state. Social order means this, that for any group to live in an organized and well-ordered form, it must be ordered by an organizing principle and an organizing force. So order is something that all human groupings must possess by definition. To live as a group, one must live under an order, under an ordering power. But not all ordering powers are the same or operate in the same way. The, sh the Shari power of social ordering had no teleology beyond the social order itself. This is important to understand. The community itself was the final end, the goal of all goals. Even in the very beginning of Islam, much of the existing social order was left intact. The rules and regulations that came with the Sharia having maintained its essential constitution. To maintain social structures is to solidify the psychosocial constitution of the environment 
in which the individual is raised, which we call today social and psychological stability. This stability was of the essence since it guaranteed the security and the conditions that allowed the individual to be raised and nourished as a dedicated particle, operating along and in mutual enhancement of other particles, those individuals in society, that is, in a system whose goal is the formation of an ethical society, again, one that does uh, the best approximation of the divine intent for a good life on earth. That is, again, explains the challenge I spoke about last time, that it is really at the bottom of everything, the, 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 the challenge of the ethical. <clears throat> Notice that even pre-Islamic laws related to homicide uh, and penal law at large, among much else, were largely maintained because destabilizing a substantial element of social ordering meant destabilizing the social order in its entirety. I would like to argue that the social order that the Sharia aimed to construct and maintain was the community, something quite different from what we nowadays call society. Society is constantly manufactured by economic modes of production and the law of the state. What is not so well known is the fact that one of the state projects is continual engineering or continually engineering the, so the social order through legislation. We tend to think that laws and regulations, especially in the sphere of personal status, are intended to regulate society, to create order for the purpose of living in security and justice. But this is only a small part of the real story. And it is actually a distorted part because we don't know the rest of the story. We just hear this. By defining legal frameworks around marriage, divorce, gender roles, LGBTQ+, I enumerated all of them last time. It took me half an hour. <laughs> Reproductive technologies and economic policies, government, governments actively shape the dynamics and structure of the family. The final results of social engineering have been catastrophic, destroying the family and even new forms of social relationships to the core. This is to be contrasted with the premium the Sharia placed on the community and its subdivisions. It was a sacred terrain to be protected at any cost. It was one of the highest values. In fact, social cohesion was such a high value that no other entity had the right to manipulate, much less to engineer. Look, for example, how the legislative power in Islam preserved this domain, a domain over which political power had no influence whatsoever. That domain was organically legislated by the guardians of the community, the so-called heirs of the prophet, or the prophets in the plural some, most of the time, and implemented by the judiciary, which was an offshoot of and substantively under the control of the leg legislative. The executive and political power only guaranteed the enforcement of the norms issued by the le legislative. And insofar as we are concerned here, the applied norms are all that matters. The enforcement is in fact a further attestation that political powers in matters of family, community, and social formations was entirely subservient to legislative will, meaning to the Sharia will, not only in terms of enforcement on the social level, but also in terms of accepting for itself to be regulated by these norms. It's like everything else, all, the, always the executive that comes from different cultures quite often, military class, military dynasty, sometimes not Islamic, it comes in and actually accepts all the val local values. They become subject to the imperatives of the Sharia ah and, the, uh, and, and its, its culture. That's very important to understand because first they get, the, the executive always absorbs the value of the legislative in Islam. That's quite powerful. And the other thing is that 
It has no say in the for social formations, not to mention even the economic formations of the civic order, which lay outside of it. These are constitutional issues of prime importance, not because they are studies only in constitutionalism, because they have uh, importance and effect on how we understand the evolution of, of, of Muslim society itself as, a, as, 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 a, as individuals, families, clans, etc., etc. The first and only time that political power begins to interfere in family affairs occurred in 1917. 1917, with the promulgation of the Ottoman family law, now seen by scholarly consensus to have adversely affected not only women, and as wives and mothers, but also men as husbands and uh, fathers. We can therefore say that at least in the Ottoman Empire, the first time society, in the sense I have just outlined, begins to be formed, was in 1917. And of course, that's when things begin to unfold, right? So now we are, most of us are now in the realm of society. We lost the, the community that the Sharia took for granted. Prior to the 19th century, on the communal level, the Sharia also left much latitude for customary law and the concept of self-rule, a concept unknown to modernity. In fact, a concept that was annihilated by the emerging nation state by necessity. The nation state does not like competition. Customary law is the law of the fathers and forefathers, the ancestral way of living in the world. Custom was sacred because people saw themselves as continuous with what they cherished most, their sense of belonging to a stable and secure way of doing things and living in the world. Custom is spiritual, but also deeply rooted in respect and civility. Custom gave individual and collective psychology safety and stability, a sense of belonging. This was acutely understood by the jurists who required custom to be factored in so many, many things they regulated. No judge, for example, can be appointed to a town without him being knowledgeable of the custom of its people. Even entire laws emerge in the Sharia without a, a Quranic or prophetic basis, such as the modalities of written evidence between the and among judges. The famous chapter in the fiqh called Kitab al-Qadi al qadi has absolutely no Quranic or Hadith basis. It says, it says the reason for it, it became Islamic and it came into the fiqh because ta'ammu bihi al-balwa. So many people do it, customary law, we have to accept it and it's useful. It doesn't run against the Sharia. This was a law entirely based on the acceptance of customary practices. Even more prominently, custom was considered one of the sources of the law. Later in later Usul al-Fiqh works, you see that in addition to uh, um, Quran, uh, uh, Sunnah, Ijma', Qiyas, and Istidlal, and all sorts of other things, the, the, uh, Al-Adat comes at the kind of, uh, but it's a source, one of the sources. Self-rule was also recognized and honored by the Sharia. Local communities under Islamic law or Islamic rule lived by a mixture of Sharia principles and laws on the one hand and customary laws on the other. In theory, this is possible as long as there is nothing repugnant in these customs to the principles of Islam. But the practice was much more open-minded and accepting. Self-rule meant self-determination in the true sense of the term, where no external power could affect the modes of living uh, of a living uh, 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 in a community has chosen for itself. The community may be overtaxed, and often it was, and wars may have at times affected it, even destroyed part of its material existence. But such intrusions 
and disruptions did not change the internal dynamic of living life as a community. Communities subject even to violent wars reconstituted themselves and continued to live by the same values that made them humans, the humans they were. And all this was due to the collaborative efforts of the Sharia norms, customary laws, and the continuing power of self-rule. This explains the impressive extent of social and communal stability in the 12 centuries of Islam until the dawn of colonialism in the 19th century. A stability that defied the calamities of famine, economic collapse, and at times intense forms of violence. The Sharia distinguished itself by a special kind of contractual relations. One can describe Islam generally as I tell my students, as a contractual civilization, a concept that can be easily gleaned from Sharia structures and modes of operation. But one can also argue that we too today live in a contractual mode of existence. So what is the difference? The difference is that our contractual relationships are both defensive and aggressive. Just think of the insurance and medical forms you sign when you go to the hospital. The disclaimers, the fine print, etc., etc., etc. And if you haven't experienced enough, come to New York, I'll show you. Think of the terms and conditions that you sign when you buy an air ticket. I don't know if you read this little fine print. You say, you go to the, to, to, to the, to the uh, click. You, nobody reads them. Try to read them. You, if you read them and you take them seriously, you will never fly in your life. <laughs> or do anything else for that matter, because there is no way for you to get anywhere. Think of opening a bank account, as simple as a bank account. Or, God forbid, when you enter a lawsuit or, 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 or go see a lawyer. You get my drift. All of this is, 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 is contractual. The Sharia, by contrast, operated a different, uh, by a different mentality. It was based on the logic of what people owe each other. This was a world of duty, not rights. A world in which every single contractual and quasi-contractual activity was permeated by the concept of fiduciary duty. The concept of amana is everywhere. Obviously, contracts and commercial transactions were subject to the principle, to this principle. That is where it appears most, ro most robustly. But the principle, psychological to the core, psychological to the core in our civilization, it is not psychological. The principle in Islam of, of fiduciary duty is psychological because it all applied to all kinds of social relations. Family members, low and high, associates, even neighbors. And these, I must say, were not just legal principles that were pre superimposed on the community, not at all. These, as I said, were cultural, enmeshed as they were in spiritual psychology. They were embedded in the logic of daily life and daily relations. To live by Sharia did not mean encountering the law only when you have a problem or when you encounter a so-called legal situation. To be a Sharia subject, which Muslims are, meant that you lived uh, the details of your life with the conviction of these values. This is why I insist that it is not just even legal culture. It is culture, period. The Sharia, in other words, was a habitus too, which is kind of, habitus is a more precise form of, to, to refer to, to, to culture. And then there is also called the discursive tradition, which is kind of narrower and more precise within uh, the habitus. The habitus is synchronic. Discursive tradition is diachronic. It goes through time. The Sharia was a lived experience through and through. It was as natural 
to the Muslim to Muslims as the American way of life is to white Americans. It was a culture, a tradition, a habitus. It was a doxa that is taken for granted. The priority of the community and family, the basis of the constitution of the human as intrinsically human, was also evident in the definition of the Muslim subject as a member of the ummah, not of the state. The individual as a member of the community was given priority over what we call today national security, military recruitment, and citizenship. For instance, in the recruitment for jihad campaigns, even the lander had a power to veto the, this, the, 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 the uh, command of the emir, of the, uh, of the imam, who could not force someone to join the jihad campaign without first securing the approval of the lender. Did you know that? So that, the, the, signif the significance of something like this is tremendous, is that, is that a lender has, has a right over the state in preventing somebody from going to join the army. The same goes for the parents who could stop their son from joining the jihad campaign if they wish to do so. Compare this to the power of the modern state today to impose this on anyone who is of a certain age. The, exception, the exceptions having uh, usually to do not with the family approval, but with physical and psychological fitness. And these are two military considerations. They are not really communal ones or family ones. I think it's also important to stress the general philosophy of the Sharia in terms of the epistemological conception of the human. Of course, some emblematic statements are well known, such as the adage that man was created to worship God. But this does not tell us much about the anthropological implications of such a statement. We can recast the matter differently and say that this adage has much to do with other maxims, such as the famous summative statement made by Shatabi, and which ever since has become paradigmatic, a statement which says, The Sharia was created to serve the interests of the people. They tell it to you in your face. But then the question arises, how do we define these interests to make them conform to the other adage that man was created to worship God? One of the imperatives, or one of the imperative determinations here is the doctrine that there are two types of knowledge, one that is beneficial and one that is not. Ilm nafi' wa ilm ghayr nafi' What is interesting here is that this distinction has proven more relevant to classifying modern knowledge in the last two, three centuries than it ever was for Islam before modernity, which was used, but was important, but now it seems to be more relevant and more important and more crucial. Any knowledge that does not lead to moral or ethical result is one that is deemed non-beneficial knowledge. Just a quick example to illustrate the point. Astronomy in Islam, like the study of uh, the human body and fields like chemistry and algebra, etc., astronomy was seen as an instrumental science that supported the main sciences of the Sharia, just as logic and grammar and theology were. They were subsidiary to the study of the Sharia. It revealed the majesty, meaning astronomy, revealed the majesty of the world and the wisdom and marvels of God's creation, all in an effort to figure out, to understand as much humanly as possible, how God's mind works. In an, in an effort to emulate it to the best we can so that we do God's work on earth. This underlies every discipline and every practice in Islam. And the Sharia sits on this logic totally. This idea is to see what, well, what did God have in mind in terms of justice in creating the world, like, like because the world was, was khuliqa bil qist and adl and haqq and all of these terms. Um, you say they get me angry sometimes. Uh, uh, there must be an idea of, of, of behind this. 
So we, we want to know what it is so we can apply it to our own context, the human context. <clears throat> but astronomy also had the practical function of reading heavenly signs for purposes of prayer and the like, a consideration that made Muslims also intensely interested in the science of timekeeping and clocks and watches, so to speak. All these are beneficial sciences, beneficial that is to develop an ethical substrate and a moral community whose purpose is the desideratum of Shatabi's statement I just mentioned. No contrast, now, now, now contrast with this, with, with, with modern astronomy, which looks as if it is the same science as the one Muslims famously and impressively developed, but in fact, it is very different. It's about the, the stars and, and the heavenly bodies, true. But the two conceptions of these, of the, uh, the two approaches to studying the world of the heavenly uh, bodies is totally as if these humans have nothing to do with each other. Modern astronomy is overwhelmingly preoccupied with what I call space colonization. To study planets generally, but also specifically to study planets in order to find a substitute for Earth, with a distant vision to move to it when we have completely destroyed our mother Earth. Uh, I urge you, by the way, to go on a kind of an exploration on YouTube. Look for those videos about uh, the, the stars and the heavens and the you know, if, if you watch enough of them, you begin to see a certain kind of conception underlying the, the logic of why they are interested in, in, in such things. Of course, many of them are just interested, many scientists are interested because, like me, I'm interested in things quite often just to learn. Although, I, as I said last time, if I dig deep enough, there is a reason. There's always a reason. But then you notice that one of the important substrates of this attitude is that we are looking for a place where there is a planet that is distant from its sun in the same, same, same distance as we have. Hopefully, it will have the same forms of life. Why? It's the same logic of drinking a bottle of Coke and throwing it away. Or when your uh, washing machine breaks in a little, you just throw it away, you buy another one. We are doing the same thing with washing machines and with, with our planet. <clears throat> Such a venture presumes destructive forms of knowledge that keep looking for solutions based on the very assumptions that produce the problems that need these solutions. Solutions which, by the same logic, will become problems that need further solutions ad infinitum. This is what can be convincingly classified as unbeneficial knowledge. The human, the real human, is, the, is, is one whose forms of knowledge must be structured in such a way so as to serve his or her humanity as an ethical subject living in and managing the world with ethical responsibility. To be a human in the Sharia and its Islam is therefore to be environmentally responsible, ethically responsible for God's creation. The Sharia, ah, the, the Sharia ah human is what we call today an environmentally responsible human. I can speak at length about a number of other correlates that enhance the picture of the primacy of the human in the Sharia, ah, and therefore generally in Islam. One can speak of a multiplicity of other matters from humility and gratitude to the relationship between human beings and wealth, but time, of course, is running out. I can just ref refer briefly to the role of property, wealth, and money in creating, in, in, in fact, in constructing, due to individual effort, an ethical mode of existence, one that eventually harks back at protecting the dignity of the poor and the downtrodden. Think of the Severity of the crime of hoarding in the Sharia. Ah. For instance, or the regulation of trade and limitations placed on prices, taxes, and tariffs. Sharia ah protectionism 
geared to serve the goals of the social justice and redistribution of wealth is anathema to the modern logic of capitalism. That's why the first thing in the 19th century, they, what colonialists did, was to, to destroy the Sharia because it was the barrier in front of them. It was anti-capitalist. Anti Although it, 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 of course, had every mechanism and motive to promote the making money. Muslims were big traders and merchants, but they were not capitalists. So it doesn't mean that if you make lots of money, it means that you have to be a capitalist. You can still make lots of money without being a capitalist. I do not think I need to argue too strongly, at least for 90% of the people inhabiting this world, that our modern system of capitalism is ruthless, greedy, and patently anti-human. Hoarding is the middle name of modern capitalism. And without it, no modern economy can survive. The corporation, the handmaiden of the state and its collaborator, has inflicted severe damage, not only on the fabric of the community and the psychological state of the individual, but wrought havoc on the environment. We tend to think of industrial pollution as the cause of our environment destruction, but the situation is much more complex. I think it is not too difficult to make the case that there is a direct link between the state and environmental degradation. The corporation, along with the state and that legitimizes and protects it, have conclusively proven themselves systematically and systemically destructive. And I hope to do, and I hope to, 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 to uh, um, I do not need to argue too much that to be destructive in this manner is to be anti-human. I will take some questions, but there, are, there is lots to unpack here, but at least this is an outline. And I tend to get tired, so I, my excuse is to finishing is to let you speak a little bit until I kind of relieve my throat. Thank you.